Hello, and welcome to today's seminar on the labor of fashion, the global COVID-19 crisis, and the politics of resistance in Bangladesh. I'm Chelsea Farrell, the Assistant Director of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. The mission of the Institute is to engage through interdisciplinary research to advance and deepen the understanding of critical issues relevant to South Asia and its relationship with the world. As part of this engagement, the Institute is running a series this spring and summer on a number of topics related to COVID-19. We're so glad you joined us today, and please check our website for any future webinars. A couple of housekeeping items for today. Today's session will be recorded. We will make this recording available on our website in coming weeks. During the question and answer session, you can submit questions directly to moderators via the Q&A function on Zoom. Due to the large number of attendees at today's seminar, we unfortunately will not be able to cover all questions. There will be a short survey automatically sent to you at the end of the session. We would ask that you kindly fill this out. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderators of today's panel, Dr. Alora Chowdhury and Dr. Dorba Mitra. Dr. Alora Helene Chowdhury is Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Her teaching and research interests include gender, culture, violence, and human rights in South Asia. Her recent books include Transnationalism Reversed, Women Organizing Against Gendered Violence in Bangladesh, and Interdisciplinary Approaches to Human Rights, History, Politics, Practice. Dr. Durban Mitra is Assistant Professor of Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and Carol K. Sportsheimer, Assistant Professor at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University. Dr. Mitra's book, Indian Sex Life, Sexuality and the Colonial Origins of Modern Social Thought, published by Princeton University Press in 2020, demonstrates how ideas of deviant female sexuality became foundational to modern social thought. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Chowdhury and Dr. Mitra, and I'd like to now turn this over to Dr. Chowdhury. Thank you. Um, good morning, and I should also say good evening to all our guests from South Asia. A very warm welcome to our panelists and gratitude to the South Asia Institute for hosting today's webinar on the labor of fashion, the global COVID-19 crises, and the politics of resistance in Bangladesh. It has been an absolute honor to plan this event with Chelsea Farrell, Assistant Director, and Salman Rafi, Program Coordinator of the Institute, as well as my friend and colleague, Dr. Durba Mitra, um, who is a professor in the studies of women, gender, and sexuality at Harvard, and who is co-chairing the session today with me. So the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic has posed an unprecedented crisis in the global apparel industry. We are seeing major fashion retailers in the global north closing their stores and laying off workers. Northern-based brands are canceling, suspending orders, or delaying payments. The current crisis is markedly different than 2013, and audiences um, will remember, of course, when Northern brands demonstrated strong public commitment for protecting the safety and security of Bangladeshi garment workers after the collapse of Rana Plaza, the deadliest industrial disaster that killed over 1,100 workers and injured over 2,500. Bangladesh is the world's second largest ready-made garment exporter after China. 81% of the country's exports are from the RMG sector and the textile and apparel sector contributes around 20% to Bangladesh's GDP, employing 4 million workers. There are reports suggesting nearly 1 million workers have lost their jobs. Workers are not getting severance pay or even their regular pay. On top of the health threat, they're also facing the impact of loss of livelihood. The first case of COVID-19 was identified in Bangladesh on March 8th, and the prime minister announced a general holiday or a nationwide lockdown on March 23rd. Since then, there have been significant confusion in communication and policies among the government, the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Export Association or the BGMEA, the nationwide trade organization of garment manufacturers in Bangladesh, the factory owners regarding factory closures, workers' wages, the distribution of the government stimulus package and more recently, reopening of some factories and implementation of safety measures. By bringing together labor rights organizers, legal experts, and critical scholars today, we hope to address some critical questions. 
Is it time that we move beyond a spotlight approach of focusing on one actor of the apparel supply chain at a time? Can we engage in effective dialogues and organizing across borders to simultaneously hold global retailers, governments, factory owners accountable for ensuring worker safety and well being? What does transnational resistance that is mindful of the power differences between labor organizers in the North and the South look like? What modes of dissent to or engagement with power structures, if any, are we seeing at this moment unfolding? in Bangladesh and across national borders. What are the optics? What are the ground realities? And what are the possibilities? So I now turn to Dr. Mitra for introduction. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Choudhury, for this incredible, uh, organizing this incredible event with such expertise that reaches across uh, questions of labor, law, uh, and of course, transnational feminism. Um, today, I have the privilege of introducing our panel of um, esteemed colleagues. These include uh, Taslima Akhtar, who was born in 1974. She is the chair of the Garment Workers Rights Associate Organization in Bangladesh, uh, Shromit Shomati, Bangladesh Garment Workers Solidarity. Taslima is also a freelance photographer who currently works as a tutor at Katsala uh, South Asian Media Institute. She has been documenting garment workers' lives and struggle through her photo photojournalism for 12 years. One of her photos, Final Embrace, which I think we all are familiar with, became the iconic photo of the Rana Plaza collapse where more than 1,175 workers died. Saslima is the editor of the book, Rana Plaza Collapse, 24th of April, Outcries of Thousand Souls. She has also served as an editorial role for the website www.1000cries.org. You'll see that it has the same title, subtitle from her book. As part of working with the community, she coordinates memorial quilt, the Memorial Quilt Project. Jyotir Moy Barua is a Supreme Court lawyer in Bangladesh with specializations in human rights violations, including gender-based rights, labor rights, freedom of expression, ICT law, among many other expertise, forms of expertise. He is also a member of South Asians for Human Rights and the coordinator of Life and Nature Safeguard Platform, Bangladesh, a human rights and environmental rights organization mainly working on development-induced displacement. Dr. Shuti uh, Sabur is currently an associate professor of anthropology and coordinator of social sciences in the Department of Economics and Social Sciences at Barak University. She is an active member of Bangladesh Mohila Parishad, the first women's organization in Bangladesh, and an ally of uh, Garment Shanti, Garment Solidarity, since the Rana Plaza collapse, collaborating with them on fundraising, rescue operations, and assisting in the production of an archive of those killed and affected by the catastrophe. For the past few years, her core research interest has been the metropolitan middle class of Bangladesh, she is currently working on her upcoming book, which we are all looking forward to, Marriage and Friendship, Social Networks of the Bangladeshi Affluent Middle Classes. She has been writing on recent social movements such as the Shahbaz Uprising, Gendered Constructions of the Nation, Culpability, and Critiquing Left and Liberal Forces um, in Bangladesh. Dr. Dina M. Sadiqi is Clinical Associate Professor of Global Liberal Studies at New York University. A member of NYU's Society of Fellows, she is also a fellow at the Center for the Study of Social Difference at Columbia University and on the advisory board of dialectical anthropology. Dr. Siddiqui has been writing about the garment industry for over 20 years. Her article, The Logic of Sedition, Resignifying Insurgent Labor in Bangladesh Garment Factories is set to come out next year. Dr. Nafisa Banjim is an assistant professor in global studies and women, gender, and sexuality studies at Lesley University. Uh, Dr. Banjim's research and teaching interests include transnational feminist theories, transnational social justice movements, globalization and feminist politics, comparative political economy, critical race theory, and South Asian studies. Her current book project, examines transnational labor activism and activist discourses developed in relation to the deadliest garment industry, industrial disaster in human history, 
the 2013 collapse of Rana Plaza, a factory building housing five garment factories in Bangladesh. As you can see, we have an extraordinary collection of experts speaking on all sorts of issues today, and I wanna welcome them, and I look forward to hearing and learning from you. I think we can pr proceed uh, to our first speaker. Our first speaker is, is Taslima Akbar, if you want to take it up. Okay. Uh, I want to give a special thanks uh, to uh, Professor Laura Chaudhry, Dr. Bamito, and uh, Nafisa Dina Siddiqui. Uh, all of you who organized uh, today's discussion, I think this discussion is a very uh, important for Bangladeshi people. And it's not only uh, for Bangladeshi people, it's uh, important for global audience also. Because we are going to discuss about the Bangladeshi garment worker uh, who um, make uh, clothes for uh, American market and European market. They made clothes and they stitch made in Bangladesh uh, in t-shirt and through stitching this uh, brand name uh, and through the whole process, they become the part of globalization. So before uh, discussing about the uh, COVID situation and what is going on on workers' life, I want to share with you a little about our Bangladeshi garment workers. Uh, all of you know that uh, more than 4 million uh, workers are in this sector and yeah, about 60% are women. And Bangladeshi garment workers, they earn more than 84% export income for our country. And uh, by sacrificing their youth, sacrificing their impression, their life, they're working from dawn to dusk with only uh, $94 each month. This is their wage and they are the cheapest labor of the world. So they make Bangladesh renowned to the world and they're very much important for our economy. But when COVID started to hit our country, when all of our, all people in our country panicked uh, with the uh, health situation, how they can uh, uh, secure their health, that time our garment workers, they don't have any time or any scope to think about their health. Because uh, all of you know that uh, in our country, more than $3.5 billion uh, international order cancel. And our owners, when already uh, Elora said that uh, on 8 March, uh, first our, in our country, the corona identified and our government declared a holiday and a lockdown from 25th March. But, uh, and then all factory was open and uh, government declared lockdown and they closed all governmental office, non-governmental office, school, college, university, everything, but uh, they were not ready to close the factory. Uh, they tried to say that they uh, cannot stop factory because uh, if they uh, close the factory, then the economy will collapse. So uh, when all, people in the country uh, were panicked that time. Our garment workers, they were uh, bound to think about their livelihood. And um, Corona actually changed all of our lives. And it has changed our uh, every day, every moment. Uh, but uh, our garment workers, they are in rush every time, every moment from March to June, uh, to save their livelihood. Um, and they don't have any uh, time to sit any place in a quiet uh, environment to think how they can um, save their uh, health. And last few months, uh, I think all of you will be agreed that we have heard um, like uh, thousands times uh, about social distancing. 
but uh, this social distancing term is um, very much a luxury for garment workers because uh, they cannot uh, maintain any kind of social distancing and they cannot think about uh, uh, health safety measures because their livelihood is in risk. And when the corona uh, started uh, to hit in our country, that time uh, they started to uh, fight against layoff, against termination, against uh, the wage condition, because all these things make their life more, more vulnerable. And all of we know that uh, corona will infect uh, all people from east to west. And it, this virus is not uh, any class bias virus. So it will uh, affect all of us. And it already started to affect uh, people from poor, people from rich, people from east, people from west, and all kind of ethnicity, gender, everybody is infected by this uh, coronavirus, but uh, no doubt that the working class people is more vulnerable situation through this coronavirus. And our uh, Bangladeshi garment workers, they are also facing a very critical time through this period. Uh, so we think that uh, Bangladeshi garment workers who contributed a lot uh, to develop our economy uh, and who are the backbone of our economy. Now uh, uh, they are in a pressure, they are under threat and our owner and government and also international brands fire, nobody is taking the responsibility and they are not sure uh, what they uh, are going to do. Uh, Sometimes we see that they are passing the, like they are passing the ball and they are not taking the responsibility and uh, they don't have any um, unified, uh, they cannot take any unified decision that what they will do. Sometimes they say that they don't need to close the factory. Sometimes they say, yes, now this is the time to uh, close the factory. And uh, when they declare that, yes, uh, uh, um, the owner of uh, the BGMEA, maybe you know the owner's association, after a few days of uh, coronavirus uh, period in Bangladesh, they uh, requested uh, all owners that uh, this is the time to close the factories. Then when they declared this, few owners uh, closed the factory and uh, the garment workers, they went back to village. And after a few days, they uh, again uh, started to open all factories and all garment factory uh, workers, they started to walk, they started to come back to the factory by any way. And it created a very big risk for the whole community because you know that more than 4 million workers are working in this sector. And if we count their family member and other people who are engaged with uh, this sector, it's a big uh, number um, within our population and in our country more than uh, near about 161 is our population. So when they started to come from village uh, to factory and uh, they, uh, they take their life risk and uh, they don't take life risk only for them. They also um, make a, a situation which, uh, which can spread the virus and uh, this whole situation create a very um, chaotic situation in our country and our government declared a two lockdown which uh, I think not um, effectively worked out and for that reason uh, if we look uh, what's going on in this time we will see that uh, uh, the number of uh, corona infected uh, uh, people is increasing and now near about 80,000 people infected and uh, near about thousands of people died in Bangladesh. So these are the situation and uh, from Bangladesh Garment Workers Solidarity and many other uh, garment workers organization from the very beginning we tried to say that and we demanded that, that uh, the factory owner and our government should 
close the factory should uh, lock down uh, factory for few times and uh, try to uh, effectively um, run the lockdown but we saw that they cannot continue this and uh, this situation uh, make the whole uh, um, sector uh, in a vulnerable situation uh, and uh, when we talk about uh, that uh, our garment workers uh, they contributed in this sector for last 40 years and this is the time to take uh, responsibility of their livelihood because uh, this is not the time to go outside uh, on street because well, garment workers when they are not getting their wage properly when they are under threat of termination and layoffs they uh, go frequently on street and they were doing protests and still they are doing protests and we think that this is not the time to go out uh, and make gathering but uh, they don't have any way because when they are hungry they don't have time to think about uh, the safety, the health condition and other things. And two days uh, ago, I was in, in, uh, in front of our National Press Club uh, and I saw that more than 1,100 workers were there and they came uh, from like a 30 kilos distance and uh, they took public uh, transport and they came in front of uh, uh, National Press Club to uh, demand their uh, five months pending wages. So these are the situation going on in our country. When I saw uh, at the, uh, when I look at the workers' face and their eyes, I feel so uh, hopeless and so devastating that, uh, that workers have to take the risk, have to take the risk, life risks to come in front of press club because um, they are not getting their wage properly and they, they are under threat. And just before a few days, uh, the owner of BGME, the uh, president of BGME, uh, so she declared that uh, uh, still termination is not uh, working. They will terminate to a worker from June. So I think that this kinds of uh, declaration um, means something different to workers. When um, they started to terminate, uh, they give a declaration that they will go to, for termination. Then in this pandemic situation, a worker will not think about their health because uh, we also saw that, um, that government and owners, they are trying to hide the actual number of corona infected worker and corona infected people. And they are trying to hide the whole health situation. They don't want to make this issue uh, bigger. So when they give a threat that they're going to uh, terminate workers, then workers also start to work uh, as much as possible because they don't want to lose their job. So uh, they're also trying to hide that uh, they are also infected. But uh, because I, I talk with workers uh, like every day and they uh, share with me that uh, every day, few workers uh, go back to home with the symptoms of corona, but they are not interested to go for testing because there is a, a huge harassment for uh, going to uh, testing and testing scope is not available for workers. Uh, so it is not so easy thing. So they think that if they uh, do test for COVID, then if they will get the positive uh, a result, then they will lose their job. So they're not interested to do COVID tests, but uh, they are uh, living with the corona symptoms and uh, they are spreading with their community because um, they live in a high density area and they also work uh, in a factory where a um, million workers work together. So these are the things Thank going on in our Thank country. Thank you, um, I So yeah. I think it would be Nice to segue into um, Jyotir Moy's segment now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Durba. And uh, thank you, South Asia Institute and Metal Institute for giving me this opportunity to uh, share my views here. As you have heard, Saslima, she has given a really vivid picture of what is happening with the government's workers in Bangladesh. 
I'm just going to give you some insight um, about the laws and uh, what what are those laws uh, government are actually following during this COVID-19 situation. To start with, we have one um, pandemic law which has been enacted in 2018, and there are um, some legal provisions where the health bosses, the health ministry, and the directorate of the public health department, they got their power to decide on these pandemic situations. But in Bangladesh, since the 8th of March, there has been no such uh, legal implication of this pandemic law in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, instead of using this pandemic law, or we have another law from 2012, which is the Disaster Management Act 2012, we could uh, if we eventually could use them to um, handle this COVID-19 situation, but government did not utilize these two law, rather they declared general holiday for everybody. But surprisingly, when we say nationwide national holiday, these um, government workers and uh, certain mega project workers were excluded from this general holiday for some um, unknown reason. So it was not stated in the government statement, but unofficially they have been working. Still, we had um, uh, workers unrest in this um, mega project and also in the uh, government's practice. As you can see, people have been agitated uh, for giving their wages, which has been fallen due for last three months, or even for the current months, they did not get any pay. It, it, it happened in the end of March or beginning of the April. People agitated in front of their factories. They have been arrested for making um, uh, demands for their wages, um, and due wages. And um, if, if I may give you some example of these cases, I, I'll, we have a report um, Certain um, a group of researchers have already published a report uh, this week on uh, the COVID-19 human rights violation issue. And there is a list of certain cases. I'm just going to give you four examples of how many cases and how the factory owners responded to the government workers. In uh, Medla Apparel at Ashulia, uh, they, they, the owners uh, filed a case against 100 named uh, workers and 300 unknown um, unknown workers. So that is one case in Atulia in Gajipur, uh, consist April uh, to, against 23 um, government workers, including including three leaders named Jalal Hawladar, Shahin, and Jahangir. In Gajipur, TRZ government over 13. Um, workers have been sued for demanding their wages. In uh, Gajipur, again, Luitex government uh, for demanding to pay their 60% of their wages, uh, at least about 53 workers have been sued on 8th of May. And another one in Gajipur, uh, Libas government, 12 to 13 government workers have been sued for demanding their wages. This is just a short list. Uh, we, we access uh, this information from the daily newspaper. So, and another one um, I should uh, specifically mention here, one uh, government leader, Shaheen Mondal, he has been picked up by the law enforcing agencies. And for 24 hours, the family members have, have not known his whereabouts. And at some point of time on 20th of, uh, uh, May he has been forwarded to the Ashulia police station and then only his family members came to know that um, he has been uh, basically handed over to a police station and then he has been sent to the Nobinogor healthcare center in Ashulia. That means he has been tortured in the police custody and uh, fortunately we have a law in 2013 which prohibits uh, custodial torture and death and there are certain uh, legal provisions um, uh, we, we need to follow, but we really don't see this law in action. This is my point. We have laws, we have certain safeguards, but those are not in action. And if I um, go on to the next uh, stage of uh, these laws, certain um, work leaders and workers have been sued under Digital Security Act as well. This is another draconian law we have been fighting um, since 2018. We had its uh, predecessor 
um, ICT Act 2006, Section 57 was a really, um, really dangerous section we had over there, and it has been replaced in this new law in 2018, Digital Security Act. Um, the spread over is probably in four sections of that uh, Section 57, has been replaced in four different sections in Digital Security Act. The result remains the same. Whoever expresses their opinion, whoever raised their voice against some sort of a corruption, illegality, then he has been dealt with in this uh, Digital Security Act. And the, the dilemma is the cases are tribal by a special tribunal created under this law to try these digital, digital security cases. Then the lower magistrate courts, they, they don't really allow them or grant bail of these um, workers. Then um, we, we have to go to the next tier of the court, like the district's highest court, the session court. Session court also don't really entertain this bail application. Then the only option left with us is to go to the higher court, the high court division under the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. Then in the meantime, it takes over three to four months to move to the higher courts. And you know, due to this COVID-19 situation, regular courts are not working. Only virtual courts have, are running with limited access of these um, bail applications and, and other applications. So um, if you are charged with a Digital Security Act case, that means you will have to suffer pre-trial uh, detention at least about three to four months. If you are lucky enough to get bail in the higher court, then yes, there is a chance to get out of uh, the jail on bail. So th these are the situations we are seeing now. And most importantly, the public health care policy we have in place in our Bangladesh has not, has not been considered in case of these garment workers and also those um, mega project workers, because we have been um, we have been told to maintain social distancing in every sphere of life, but in, you know, in a highly dense, highly populated country like us, and the working condition we have in the garment factories, it is quite impossible to maintain this social distancing. And that's why, that's how actually this uh, garment workers contracted um, COVID-19. And, uh, and at least about two, more than 200, I think 68 persons have been contacted with uh, COVID-19 uh, government workers. And this is only because we did not consider about their public health and we did not consider about their right to life, which is guaranteed by the constitution of Bangladesh. And this right to life is an inalienable right and it does not have any condition attached to it. So the government and all other institutions were supposed to honor this right to life of the garment workers, irrespective of their class, their identity, or whatever it is. If a person is a citizen of Bangladesh, then he has this protection from the constitution of Bangladesh. But this is only by the book. This is only in the book and it's not in practice. So um, the legal implication is very poor here. If, if, um, if we consider other legal provisions, uh, you will see the same sort of uh, mismanagement, lack of coordination is happening here. And if we come to the um, layoff and other uh, the stacking or retrenchment of these workers, if we have a level of from 2006. There are certain sections, certain provisions which the uh, owners were supposed to follow. But in, in uh, April, I think 70 to 80% factories had declared layoff without following the government directions. The government only declared general holiday. They did not declare any lockout or all other provisions which were available under the pandemic law 2018. So the government's owners basically did not have that luxury to declare layoff, to be speaking strictly on the point of law. Then in, uh, if, if we look into the um, examples of other neighboring countries like in Pakistan, the Pakistan Labor Ministry declared that they, they issued basically a gazette notification that no factories can declare layoff and uh, up to 3rd of May. And uh, in India, there has been uh, advisory uh, directives from the, from the government to not to lay off. And um, if we uh, take the example of UK, uh, same sort of advisory directives have been issued uh, to the uh, factories all sorts of factories basically, not only governments, uh, all sorts of factories for the, for the labor. And government declared 80% of, um, of wages and uh, the owners, factory owners had to um, 
here twenty percent of the wages. So these are the examples. So it could be. Thank you, um, Jyoti Moy, for um, pointing out these inconsistencies, and we will certainly revisit them. Uh, I think it's a good moment to move to our next speaker, uh, Shuti. Hi. Uh, thank you, Durba and Elora and uh, South Asian Institute to host us. Um, I will summarize some of Lima's point and I will try to uh, look into the rhetoric of life and livelihood. Um, if we look into the data, what it doesn't tell us is that it's not the life of 4 million garments worker, but it's the life of their families and others. Um, if we uh, go back to the timeline, how, how it all happened, which already discussed by Elora and Lima uh, a couple of times. Um, and I will just, just uh, put the, uh, connect the dots here. Uh, the, the first thing, I mean, the general lockdown, uh, what, what happened after general lockdown? I mean, we see that stimulus packages as has been announced by the, um, uh, by the uh, prime minister, we see um, our uh, beloved leader of BGMEA uh, crying out loud to the, uh, to the uh, buyers that not to let go of our hands and, um, and, and stay with us. And they managed to bring back H&M, um, CNA, and other big brands um, to, the, to, to buy back the products they have already ordered, which was in process. And um, what we also see is that they actually push government to um, offer the stimulus package, which is, um, which is, which is a hefty amount. Um, it, it closed to $8.5 billion um, as a soft loan. Now, the question is, with the stimulus package, with this, uh, this cry and, and all of this, what did actually this, this BGMEA government and other bodies and, and, and other actors did uh, to help out the, help out the uh, workers? Um, the answer is nothing, actually. Um, what we see is that uh, when the general lockdown uh, was announced, um, there was uh, absolutely, the workers have been working throughout the March and they didn't get the pay. Uh, they had to go back home. And when social media was, uh, was teaching us how to maintain the social distancing, um, the, the, this whole uh, evacuation of Dhaka by garments worker on mass was, was um, outraged the elite and the middle classes that these are the bodies which is, is the cause of the pandemic. They don't know what they're doing. These are the illiterate people. Are, these are the ignorant, ignorant people. Now, look at the rhetoric, the middle class and the media and, and, and the state, everybody is shunning the, um, shunning the worker, uh, where we are not acknowledging the fact that it is impossible to uh, live with $95 per month, and when you don't have the salary of that month uh, at hand, and, and after paying the credits and everything, what you're left with is you can actually run mostly for 10 days uh, a month. And it is impossible to leave in Dhaka city with that much of money in hand. So they have, they, they have chosen the, the easiest option to go back. Um, and, uh, and that is instead of leaving in limbo. But what happens next is even more interesting. And that actually um, is, is really frightening because um, we see the hundreds and thousands of workers paraded back on, on 4th of April, then on 15th of April. Um, and, and, uh, and basically what, what we see is that they, are, they, they were asked to leave because there was a miscommunication, quote unquote miscommunication uh, among BGMEA, uh, the owner and the worker. So they don't get the pay of 820 uh, till April 4, they don't get the pay of March, and we have to uh, remember 72% of this, this, this uh, worker actually have been leaving without pay for over three to four months, and, and only a handful of few factories actually paid for the March salary. That's, that's about it. So, and unfortunately, when we look at the actors who are acting in, in the field, in the political field here, is the trade unions who are negotiating, it's, it's 
it's BGMEA government and, and some other bodies, regulatory bodies, and workers. So basically workers at the trade, the only people who can negotiate between workers and trade union, uh, it, uh, sorry, worker and the state and, and BGMEA is the trade union people, uh, which is already co-opted. Under the neoliberal regime, this, the trade union movement has been co-opted. So the representative that we see in the trade union it's shamelessly they're voting for opening up the uh, opening up the um, out of 20 trade unions representatives um, 11 of them voted in for opening the um, opening the factories and only nine said it's it's not okay because you are actually pushing people in the peril and and, and taking the risk at increasing the health risk of the in, in the pandemic now the problem here is that this, this, the onus of, of, uh, of how, to, um, who, how to get, who gets affected is, is put on the, on the able-bodied people. So basically uh, the workers are the one who are here to like, they, it is their duty not to get affected and be the able-bodies to work in the factories while we, the elite and the owner can sit in the back uh, in, 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 in our safety net. And uh, that is a problem with the, this whole situation. And what, what this pandemic has, um, has actually exposed us to is this, this whole um, problem with the, uh, how we, we are identifying these bodies. And, the, and what happened is that when this, this the official lockdown was over, the factories were open, the, the worker came back and, and, and resumed their work. And the number soared. And, and uh, Garment Solidarity already had a, a the study which talks about the numbers of, of how people uh, are getting affected. But interestingly, uh, uh, again, our beloved leader in BGME is actually talking about the, uh, the hard immunity uh, and 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 this this uh, immunity special kind of immunity this this worker has so people the body which has been shunned two days back for creating and be, being the cause of the pandemic and the, the dirty bodies who are the causes of the pandemic becomes this essential body because this essential body would actually run the factory the machines running and and so they become not only the essential they all of a sudden overnight becomes the able-bodied citizen here now the thing is like we are talking about able-bodied citizen but we are talking we are absolutely uh forgetting the the things that they are entitled as a citizen we are not dis i mean we are not like it's not even talking about the, the problem with the rhetoric is that we are this disposable body, which was yesterday, becomes able body through our rhetoric and through the rhetoric of the garments owner and the state. And we actually switch between the rhetoric whenever it suits us. The problem here is that when we are not, not treating this, this uh, workers as fellow citizen, we are actually stripping away their basic right and entitlement. The entitlement that legally bind the owner and the buyer to give them the furlough, par partial um, payment for the furlough. And, uh, and also, um, I think it's, it's called, uh, let me check with the terminology, I think, uh, severance pay. So uh, they're supposed, they're by law, they're entitled to get, get the partial payment for the furlough from the buyer and uh, owner is, give, is supposed to give the severance pay. None of this are happening. And the, the problem with the profit centricity and this, this rhetoric of, of competitive market and thin margin is making this, this worker even more vulnerable, but also it is um, disguising the strength that the factory owner could have in the bargain. I mean, when you're talking about the thin margin and profit and competitive market, you are essentially not bargaining for the worker, but your profit. And that is a problem because fast fashion needs you as, as, as we need them. So it's, it's, a, it's a basically, it's a, 
it's a relationship, symbiotic relationship that we own. So if we uh, look into the sector, if we look at the global uh, supply chain, then you cannot have this fashion industry surviving without us. So the bargain from the BGMEA and government should have been that to claim this, their side of the demand and, and, and claiming the basic right and entitlement for the worker instead of uh, basically having this miscommunications and, and making this uh, worker even more vulnerable. So my, my problem here is that uh, we know this capitalism is extremely cruel, and, but, but the thing is we are not helping in this factor. Neither state or not BGME uh, being responsible enough and they are trying to put the blame on, on buyer's shoulder. But I think when we talk about su supply chain equally, everyone is equally culpable. So Thank we you. need to okay. really, so yeah, I'm okay. Going to, um, Thank you. This is really fascinating. And I know that we have um, more speakers talking about the rhetoric and the language um, of capitalist development. So we'll move to Dina. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. That's a very nice segue. Um, thank you, everybody. I wanted to thank the South Asia Institute, but also Durba, Ilora, and especially Nafisa for bringing us all together. She did a lot of the initial work and I'm really appreciative of having a chance to have this amazing conversation. I am far away. I'm going to talk more about what hasn't changed under, uh, after COVID and, and um, also the spaces that may have opened up. Uh, and I'll try to be brief. I've written up some comments. I don't know how it'll go. So the pandemic, despite all the death and destruction it has unleashed, has actually also had a powerfully illuminating effect. It has forced into popular discourse and imagination, at least having to think about inequality, usually things that you know, are invisible are not seen, especially in, in relation to the structural violence of the economy. I think we're in a different phase now, whether we're in the US or in South Asia, it's not as easy as it was before to just not think about which bodies are likely to be infected, who is left to die and who is allowed to live. One thing I think the pandemic has done, it has punctured a whole set of liberal and imperial myths around neoliberal capitalism and third world women who need to be saved, especially Muslim, Muslim women. These myths are very much, have become our common sense um, and they produce popular consent in otherwise, to otherwise exploitative systems. And the first myth of, of, is the empowerment of women, especially of Muslim women being lifted or lifting their families out of poverty through factory work. And I'm not saying that individual women have not actually changed their lives, but there have been very few structural changes. But you know, if you read the New York Times or something, you know, just from last week, I, there was this whole, the framing is very much about how this factory work will just lift the woman and the family and the nation out of poverty, right? And it's most recently embodied in, for instance, Nike's Girl Effect Initiative, which at least we in the US have heard a lot about. And in Bangladesh, I think another powerful set of myths have grown up around the garment industry and it, the empowerment of women to the extent where the very powerful owners lobby, the BGMEA, until recently it could do no wrong, right? For brands, um, paying, you know, what, the, what these myths have done is that, you know, they justify cheap racialized labor. They justify paying factories as little as possible because there's this idea that there's almost like you're doing corporations are doing a favor by being in Bangladesh. Okay, um, but what other uh, speakers have referred to is right now we see the big brands have actually broken their contracts. They've um, refused to pay for goods that they actually had contractual obligations to take on and to pay for. And they've done this um, by doing this, first of all, they made their priorities clear. 
they have made clear that what they're re really interested in is in profits and that the so-called ethical business model is a secondary, secondary. Um, it's not a priority, but it's a secondary can, uh, model when it's convenient. So um, it's very interesting because what we see is when they don't actually pay up, I think this is our chance to really, I see some audience questions about what can consumers do or what can people in the United States do? Well, you know, we have to stop thinking of these corporations as doing good, as capitalism, as being beneficial for both sides. It's a very unequal system. And, and this myth of free and equal trade, I think we really need to attack this. And how is it that um, corporations can just do this, not pay after signing contracts? They can do it because trade rules are made by the powerful for the powerful. So there is something called a clause that I did not know about before the pandemic called the force majeure, which actually says, um, which gives companies a little sort of uh, a way to slip out of their contracts in case there is uh, there are disasters. And you know it's a very vague kind of clause, but it's a loophole. Now, any other way, I would think, you know, that to me seems pretty criminal, but we don't call it criminal. We just call it, you know, going by the rules of trade, of free trade. We need to think about that. And hopefully we are beginning to move away from I mean, an unquestioning acceptance of this idea of corporate benevolence, which we really do have in the United States. And I'm really talking about the United States here because, um, this is where I live and work. So this idea of corporate social responsibility has had extremely pernicious effects on transnational organizing. And I know Nafisa is going to talk about this later. And solidarity, we see this in the wake of the much celebrated Accord on Fire and Building Safety, for instance. It's very popular. It was very popular with European and American leftist activists. And somehow, and of course it was necessary, you know, we needed building safety and fire safety, but it, was, it didn't address the key structural aspects of workers' lives that made them so desperate that they were desperate enough to enter a building that was going, you know, obviously had cracks in it, okay? Um, it didn't address, somehow the accord became the solution to Bangladesh's garment industry problems. And it became the solution, not inside Bangladesh, where a lot of people weren't necessarily talking about it, but Europe and North America, to the exclusion of talking about other things, other issues. And the result is 25 years later, we see um, exactly the same set of problems. We see exactly what hasn't changed after 2013 in particular. Um, no lack of payments, blacklisting, firing if you speak up, all of those things that were there 25 years ago when I first started field work, they're there. The accord basically, as many, many people have shown, uh, the accord rendered technical what were essentially political problems. Okay, and more importantly, I think the accord really left the supply chain intact. Um, Shuti was talking about how we need to talk about all aspects of the supply chain. I totally agree, and I will get to the BGMEA in a minute. But I think one of the things the pandemic has laid there, another myth, about the supply chain as sort of an equal opportunity way of producing goods, it's supply chain at the current pandemic has shown the extreme asymmetry in supply chain capitalism, okay? Because there is, you know, and that asymmetry really affects laboring bodies in places like Bangladesh. So um, the tremendous power that brands have over local manufacturers means they can push down prices as much as they like, okay? And local factories who don't want to lose their profits then pass on the burden to workers by increasing individual quotas, hiring workers. This is exactly what happened after Rana Plaza. And Lima and others can talk about this, you know. I, long before any COVID crisis, at the same time that Nike and other companies were giving money for training on sexual harassment or maternity payment, uh, 
most of these uh, corporate brands were pushing down buying prices, which actually did have a very bad effect on a lot of factory owners as well, and but ultimately on garment workers. Now, this is really well documented. Mark Anner has actually documented how abuse in factories is related to this lowering of prices. It's documented, but it's so interesting that it never reaches um, northern audiences, or it doesn't, that the focus on the accord sort of, as I said, crowded out these other things, you know. And it partly, of course, you know, the question of what global audiences see. You know, this is, there are some things global audiences just don't see. Right. Oh, Sabina, no, um, oh, I'm, oh gosh, uh, okay. having to have a lot of things to say. Our next speaker, but this question of optics is uh, yeah. really critical, and we're going yeah, to come back to it. Um, sure. I guess I didn't get your message either. Thank okay. you. Okay. Nafisa. So um, I wanted to focus on the question of who is speaking for whom in the landscape landscape of garment labor organizing during the global COVID-19 crisis. And uh, before I address this, I wanna briefly touch upon what happened in transnational labor organizing after the collapse of Rana Plaza in 2013 and before this COVID-19 crisis. And thank you so much, Dina, for already touching upon it and I'll just be brief. So the Accord and Alliance, they both put a disproportionate amount of spotlight on transnational labor organizing and they focus mostly on the questions of building and fire safety of garment factories. The leftist progressive labor rights circle lauded accord, which is basically a legally binding agreement between brands and local and international labor rights groups for being a major breakthrough and game changer. And they mostly focus on criticizing alliance for merely adapting a corporate social responsibility model. But both accord and alliance relied on a private governance mechanism to exclusively shine the spotlight on a technocratic definition of workplace safety that is building on fire safety in this case, while ignoring other forms of safety, such as living wage, job security, or safety from sexual harassment. So there was a huge disconnection between transnational organizing efforts and Bangladeshi grassroots organizing initiatives. Small grassroots, non-cosmopolitan Bangladeshi labor rights groups, uh, for example, Taslima's organization, they mostly focus their organizing energy on addressing exploitative practices of garment factory owners and the Bangladeshi government. And, address, and addressing brands often remains out of their purview. On the other hand, transnational leftist progressive organizing initiatives center their energy on pushing global brands to take the responsibility, while to some extent giving benefits of the doubts to the local suppliers and the Bangladeshi government. So the question is, how does this disconnection and the difference and priorities between local and global labor organizing initiatives affect workers' experience during the COVID-19 pandemic? As of today, according to the BGMEA website, 1,150 factories reported a total of $3.18 billion worth of cancellation or suspension of orders, which affected 2.28 million garment workers. In a recent interview with NY Times, Rubana Hogg, the president of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association said, and quote, for them, which basically means the global brands, and then she said, it's a question of the survival of the businesses. For us, it's the survival of our 4.1 million workers. First of all, I would argue that it's not a simple us versus them question. Workers and factory owners can't be collapsed within the same us. Despite the brutal impact of the series of suspensions and cancellations of orders on the Bangladeshi garment industry, the BGMEA and the Bangladeshi and Bangladeshi garment factory owners will continue to have a tremendous amount of power and control over the garment workers. And also the question is not necessarily a binary one between business versus survival, because European and American retailers are also struggling to pay their frontline store workers at a mass scale. And many of these workers have already been laid off and many are depending on, on unemployment benefits, which are obviously not enough considering the extent of the current crisis. Many of the workers are organizing with their unions and allies, they're staging strikes, demanding fair treatment from the giant retailers and demanding their rights for survival. 
And in the same way, and unlike the way Rubana Hawk, the president of BGME framed it in Bangladesh, it's not just a question of survival for workers. It's also a question of business as well. In fact, we do see that the question of business is carefully appropriated by the narrative of the survival of workers. And how exactly is this happening? And here I find feminist historian Michelle Murphy's framing of economization of life very helpful. So economization of life can be explained as a governance mechanism through which the protection of the national economy and the owning class is justified through the narrative of preserving lives of disposable feminized workers. And it is a mechanism through which economic me metrics are used to determine who gets to stay at home and stay safe from the contagion and who gets to work and remains exposed. So in Bangladesh, on one hand, we see that garment workers' livelihoods are threatened as they are left without work and income. And on the other hand, their cramped homes, their workplaces offer little to no protection from the contraction of the coronavirus. But BGMEA is overwhelmingly focusing on the economic well-being of workers, ignoring the health safety, health safety risks they're experiencing. And in fact, just a few days ago, Rubana Hogg, the president of BGMEA, basically said that the actual number of COVID cases among garment workers is far less than the, pro than the projected number because, and I'm quoting her here, poor people have a certain form of power. They know how to fight. They are aware and they just believe that they won't get sick. So going back to what Shiti was talking about, the bodies of garment workers were not just described as able-bodied. It seems like they, they have certain kind of supernatural power that they just believe that they won't get sick and they don't get sick. And the statement doesn't take into consideration that the wait list for getting a COVID test in Bangladesh is really long. It's, it, it gets super expensive if you want to get the test done through private channels. There are many workers who are getting sick and dying, and we would never know the actual number because these workers were never tested. And in another video message to international buyers, Rubana Hawk said, we will have 4.1 million workers literally going hungry if we don't all step up to a commitment to the welfare of the workers. And I would argue that this hyper focus on workers' economic welfare, this humanitarian survival narrative as circulated by VGMEA, perfectly aligns with their business interests as their historical track records for, for protecting workers' safety and security and well-being are very, very questionable. I mean, um, why is the same BGME which vehemently resisted providing garment workers the living wage and raising the minimum monthly salary to $200 a month, and eventually they settled down with $95 a month just one and a half years ago, and now they're using the language of worker survival and welfare as their business of, as usual gets threatened by the global COVID-19 pandemic. And the interesting thing is if you think about what the international media is doing, think about NY Times, Guardian, Forbes, Fortune, NPR, Al Jazeera, they are covering how the suspension and cancellation of orders and irresponsible behaviors of the retailers are threatening the Bangladeshi garment industry. But um, the coverage I mean, I, I would argue that the coverage is really crucial, but very few of those international media actually reached out to garment workers on the ground and inquired about their experiences and very few actually touched upon all the things that the Slima, uh, Jyotima and Shilpi just talked about. So I would end with just um, saying three things. First of all, this simplistic and opportunistic, opportunistic, opportunistic framing of welfare ignores a more critical, complicated, and structural dialogues about the failure of the just in time and lean production in the global supply chain. And it doesn't take into consideration the roles of retailers as well as BGMEA, Bangladeshi garment factory owners and the Bangladeshi government. The second uh, thing I want to talk about is the current COVID-19 crisis demonstrates an overwhelmingly disproportionate amount of global attention to a strictly technocratic form of safety and security through which uh, it, it, it demonstrated that, 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 that the technocratic uh, focus on accord and alliance did very little to provide workers with a safety net to take care of their jobs and physical and emotional well-being. And lastly, it's, it's a very broad comment, but I think it's really important to say it out loud that exclusively focusing on the garment industry and trying to provide garment industry specific solutions will not bring sustainable changes because the problem lies in the larger capitalist neoliberal structure of our society. And the way we naturalize the free market economy, the widespread privatization, the shrinking state, the non-existence of social security, and our over-reliance on corporate philanthropy, goodwill of NGOs, and individual charity for addressing deep-rooted structural challenges. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Nafisa, and thank you to all of our uh, panelists for that um, extremely rich and informative uh, session. And I'm not going to make any attempt to capture uh, themes or go over them because there are just um, so many. Um, I, 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 I'm starting to look at the questions from our audiences, and um, I see that you know many of them are around um, three themes that all of you touched upon and maybe I'll just say the th three themes very briefly. Uh, so one has to do with the, uh, the particular moment of the COVID-19 crisis because you know as um, Aslima said at the outset that there, there is some significant difference between what happened in 2013 and what is happening now in the sense that you know the focus may have been more um, on Bangladesh, whereas now we are seeing sort of a global impact of um, the, the virus on the supply chain. And so what are some of the ways that resistance um, on the ground and across borders uh, can look like effective resistance? Um, secondly, there are questions about um, the language, the rhetoric, um, the optics, and uh, certainly the inconsistencies of these, as many of you have um, laid out um, very clearly, this uh, narrative of suffering um, of us versus them and who does it really serve. And um, also these paradoxes, right? The development paradoxes that after 40 years of uh, this industry, um, we are still seeing the framing of workers as uh, Shuti said at one moment as contagion, but on the next um, as heroic um, super uh, bodies who can survive anything and continue on this path of uh, cruel uh, development. There's, there are also questions about the selective enforcement of law, as um, Jyotirmoy was talking about, that you know, we have these uh, pandemic laws and the, uh, the disaster laws, um, and what, you know, if, if we look at regionally, what has um, India done, what has Pakistan da done, and you know, how are we using or not using effectively at all these laws or instrumentally um, using them, and who are they actually uh, serving? Um, and thirdly, we also see a dimension um, of, uh, of I, I should say that a notion of solidarity. So um, if uh, any of you want to speak to that as well, that, you know, what, what, what does this moment say about uh, the possibility of transnational uh, solidarity and, and care? Um, so I just want to give a minute or two to see that if uh, any of you want to respond to one another, um, any questions or comments you have to what um, you said, and we can take a minute to do that. I want to share a few things. Okay. Uh, I want to give special thanks to Shuti and um, Nafisa. I'm totally agreed with uh, Nafisa uh, that uh, when the COVID crisis comes to us, it's not same. Uh, to owner and workers and from the very beginning from worker side we tried to say that uh, the first priority should be the health concern uh, because the garment workers they are not uh, only profit making tools they are human being they are citizen uh, the attitude of owners uh, towards the workers that uh, they are like uh, only like a tool like a machine who can make profit and uh, we demanded that uh, owners and government should ensure uh, workers 100% wages in this pandemic time, but they are not ready to give the 100% wages and uh, owners from the very beginning, they try to say that they are not able to give uh, one month salary than what they are doing last 40 years. And um, uh, we also try to say that uh, they should uh, make an emergency fund. They don't have any emergency fund. They are not able to give uh, one month salary. And uh, if they are not able to do anything for workers, then government should take the responsibility. Government should um, bound uh, owner uh, to contribute for workers and also the owner and government should uh, bargain with the international brands because international brands, they are taking the lion part of uh, profit from this sector, but they are not taking the responsibility. And Bangladeshi garment workers, they are the cheapest labor of the world. 
So this is not the issue about Bangladeshi people uh, who wear Bangladeshi product. They should know about the story behind that T-shirt, I think. So um, I want to give special thanks to South Asian Institute. And I think through this discussion, we can make a um, solidarity bridge with uh, Bangladeshi people and international audience to uh, save our workers' rights. And in our country, Bangladeshi garment workers, they cannot practice their uh, trade union rights, which is a very uh, important thing in this sector, I think. So uh, we don't have any scope to express our freedom of expression. Uh, that already Jyoti Mahida said, I think uh, we need to uh, work on these issues together. Thank you. Thank you, Taslima. Um, any other comments to yeah, from the speakers? Yes, uh, I want to add with uh, Taslima because I think it's high time also um, uh, when I talk about the uh, equal culpability of each actor uh, embedded within the field. I also meant that this is also the time to push for uh, minimum, not only minimum wage, but as a trade unionist um, uh, and uh, global uh, a global so whoever is showing global solidarity to bring out the uh, question of insurance for this uh, in, in crisis. Because even after Rana Plaza, and as the Taslima, uh, the Taslima and Nafisa both said that uh, after Rana Plaza, we only, we are talking about the technicalities and, and compliances, but workers' safety, safety and, uh, and in, ensuring their life uh, is absolutely essential, I think, pandemic has made that even more clear and and uh, and how much one can exploit the worker that has to be questioned um, if not anything else thank you just add something sure Dina just very quickly is I think um, it's very it's very clear that 2013 left structures intact whatever the accord did it was very corporate centric right I, but there's a larger question here is this industry is 40 years old. We keep talking about how it's helped to grow the economy, but I think it's really important to try and re rethink what we mean by sustainable development, because how is it that 40 years later, we can't produce a fund for workers that, you know, you, if, if this is a successful industry, why don't we have a system in which workers are not are paid enough? that they have some wages, that they have a cushion or job security. It's been 40 years. These are not new issues. Our ideas of what constitutes development and progress really need to be rethought. And I think this is what we're seeing. I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Um, so shall we move to the audience questions? Um, I wanted to start with a question for uh, Jyotir Moy, actually, and uh, perhaps we can go back to where you left off, Jyotir Moy. You were just uh, starting to talk about some of the laws that in the region versus what we are seeing in Bangladesh. And um, if you see any possibility of perhaps trans-regional um, cooperation here. Yeah. Um... I have seen that question in the question answer uh, box. It is quite difficult in our legal systems. We um, were, uh, were asking whether there is any international legal tool to force the uh, local R&D uh, owners to comply with them. But in our legal system, if an international law is not incorporated into our own legal system, then it has no effect. You cannot enforce it in Bangladesh. Even if it is a UN treaty or any other sort of treaty where Bangladesh already um, um, signed that contract, party to that contract, or ratified uh, this provision, unless or until it is incorporated into our national law, you cannot enforce it. So it is quite difficult, even if you ask for the regional cooperation, regional work on this issue, until or unless we ourselves decide that we are going to. Um, we're going to keep these people alive and survive this industry uh, working together. This is not going to work, basically, because if you see the way they have been working, as I said earlier, that 
so the government declared national holiday for everybody general holiday for everybody but uh, in terms of the uh, mega project workers and the government workers they were not getting this benefit of um, holiday there have been um, there have been lay off they have been um, uh, facing persecution for raising their demands for paying their uh, arrear wages and uh, because of this sort of treatment you can see that what sort of power this rmg owners hold at the moment in bangladesh power structure if you look into the um, the percentage of member of parliament and their professions and what they do most of them are basically rmg workers now it, it has to it used to be 10 years back it used to be only 30% probably now it it is more than 60 70% now most of them are the rmg um factory owners so that's why you can see that they are kind of not on the leash they they can do whatever they want or whatever whatever government decides they can decide their own way of working things up so it, that's why i was saying from the very beginning that we have starting laws in our country but not in practice that that don't have any application in reality so we cannot fight them so one of my friend in the question also about we are asking in this um, uh, covid 19 pandemic situation where the state of emergency which can be declared under the constitution or the lockdown can we enforce the fundamental rights in this moment in the high court division because that is the only forum according to our constitution where we can enforce our fundamental rights to be honest with you due to the covid 19 court was not functioning properly and after a certain period of time virtual court um, has been running with a very limited scope and uh, due to this non functioning of the regular court system we could not enforce the violation of fundamental rights as i have already pointed out in our in my uh, presentation from the reports which have been published by the certain researchers in this way that uh, we could not go to the high court for enforcing the fundamental rights as if there are some undeclared state of emergency we are going on in our country because we could not enforce it and uh, only a single judge bench is running as virtual court you know for uh, compelling the, getting an order of this sort of fundamental rights issue you definitely need a division bench to judge the court so we don't have a two judge court running at the moment it's only a single judge uh, trying to dispose of urgent matters very important matters at the moment so um and the uh, two other things um, i have to just quickly wrap up is that the state of emergency in in case of state of emergency which can be declared under the constitution you don't have any fundamental rights during that state of emergency but government is mistakenly using this word war against the covid-19 pandemic this is definitely not a war this is a this is a pandemic situation pandemic you cannot um, just describe a pandemic situation with the war and this lockdown does not really cannot be used as a parallel to the state of emergency so lockdown is a lockdown for a temporary period to tackle the situation of the pandemic and there are certain rights which are which you enjoy during this period and if, if i Uh, clearly mention again about the disaster management act 2012 it has uh, it has all the clearly defined rights under that particular law though it has certain limitations as well but coming to the point of legal right you can still enforce certain rights but government has not been using any of this either of these laws to tackle this covid-19 situation they are just using randomly their uh, prerogative powers and declaring holidays and uh, pe- asking people to stay at home and whenever people were coming out for doing their uh, regular things or for no reason they have been um, bashed bash, uh, arrested by the police humiliated by the police and uh, this sort of uh, inconsistent uh, actions were taken against the general public including the government workers and all others so uh, this is quite difficult when when we are talking about international law or the regional cooperation i don't know how this is going to work when we have law that is not in action in our country we did not see it in the last three four months since end of uh, march thank you so i think um it's a good moment to maybe i'll ask nafisa to take this question um then about transnational um legal 
avenues open here since you know Jyoti Moy has already talked about the national and regional um, and the uh, the person who's asking the question is saying that here the U.S. is also woefully behind so this may be a moment of moving beyond the western inclination to save others but rather to lift each other up simultaneously and do you see that there is anything in the horizon that perhaps transcends the technocratic focus of the accord and alliance Thank you so much for asking such an important question. So um, when, when I talk about taking transnational initiatives, I think we should approach the question with a little bit of caution because oftentimes we come up with ideas like, okay, universal social floor is the solution to address this, but we forget that individual realities of those individual countries and individual contexts are very different. So before we start thinking about adapting a transnational approach to address it. I think those local specificities, specificities are really important to address. Um, Accord, to some extent, um, it was a really good initiative considering that it tried to work in collaboration with international labor rights groups, multinational corporations, local and um, global labor rights organizers, but where it fell short was um, the top-down approach of doing this transnational solidarity where they really reached out to local grassroots voices and specifically government workers and asked about um, what they actually need and how safety and security look like for them. So in terms of transnational solidarity, and can I also touch upon a few other questions that I'm seeing here? People have questioned about what I can do from my part, what people in North America or in the West can do, whether there are ways to kind of merge uh, Black Lives Matter movement with um, government, right, government workers movement. So maybe I can just briefly touch upon sure. what can you do for so first of all, I guess all of us need, need to acknowledge that this focus on what can I do, it's a really like, individualistic neoliberal notion that if just I can do my own part correctly, it's going to solve the problem because that just doesn't solve the problem. Your government needs to do something. The corporations who are buying your products from, from they need to do something. Your liberal rights, local and global liberal rights organizations need to do something. And it sounds extremely complicated. So maybe I'll just talk briefly about, you know, the things that you can do while acknowledging that, you know, I mean, all of us have to do our parts to make sure that those things are addressed, can be addressed. Um, ethical consumerism is oftentimes promoted highly to kind of think about um, what you can do to help those workers, but ethical consumerism only grows up, an, up to a certain level. And to be honest, in Bangladesh, those government workers need jo those jobs. So just boycotting a corporation doesn't solve the problem. And also it kind of puts the power back to the consumers and doesn't take into consideration what workers are doing, what local liberal rights organizers like Taslima and others are doing. So what can you do? You need to study. And you, please don't, and I'm specifically speaking to um, a Western audience, please don't just read the Western news sources. There are plenty of um, writers and journalists and scholars that are writing from Bangladesh um, who are writing on what's happening in Bangladesh. So it's really important to learn from the local sources. And I think that will give you a very interesting and multi-layered perspective of what's happening and what you can do. So if you just look at the Western sources, they're just talking about, oh, I mean, hold the brands responsible, but that's not the only story. And I guess it's pretty clear from this panel that there are just so many intricate layers. Um, try to support grassroots organizing initiatives. And that might mean donating to organizations um, like the organization that Taslima is leading. And there are many other grassroots organizations in Bangladesh. Sometimes they look for translators. They want to circulate their narratives online. So if you have free time, you can volunteer for uh, those organizations. You can circulate the stories. If you are a social media user, go to the websites of those organizations, go to their Facebook pages, and then circulate the narratives and try to learn different layers of struggles. And also here in North America, we need to put pressure on the brands and how can you do so? Maybe you can write to your Congress and House representatives and ask them not to take funding from exploitative corporations. Maybe you can push them to bring bills that will make those corporations accountable for workers. If you are a student or if you're a professor, if you're working at a university setting, there are student groups like United Students Against Sweatshops that organize in different universities and they try to hold their universities liable for ensuring that the clothing and the apparel materials that are sold on campus are are sourced from corporations that are, that are trying to protect workers' rights. So maybe you can 
engage with organizations, maybe you can open a local chapter of USAS on your campus and then take it from there. If you are a writer, write about it. If you're a journalist, try to cover the stories. If you are on social media, I mean, tweet about it. If you are in Bangladesh, try to work with local grassroots organizers. You can try to participate in rallies and protests, in online demonstrations. You can do a lot of things while staying at home as well. I mean, all of these organizations, they're doing different, they're organizing different events. They're doing Facebook Live. You can participate in those um, initiatives don't just rely on donating for workers when there is a disaster. You need to actively engage in labor movement and um, challenge the hegemony of BGMEA. I mean, this is an extremely powerful body in Bangladesh. They have so much of close ties with the government and collectively we really need to challenge the hegemony. So, yeah. Thank you, Nafisa. So um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to ask two, two more questions from the audience. And the first one, I think I'm going to um, ask uh, Taslima and Shuti if you can comment on this. So um, uh, it, the question is asking, how can we build value for what is made by government workers? Sorry, how can we build value for what is made by garment workers as pushing down prices relates in large part to consumers' willingness to pay? Looking longer term, fast fashion may not come back as it has been. What discussions are taking place about options for these talented workers, such as developing handcraft textile enterprises. So perhaps, you know, the uh, looking ahead, the change that we will inevitably see in fast fashion and how are uh, workers on the ground and uh, policymakers perhaps thinking about that. So um, Shruti and uh, Aslima, if you can speak to that. We'll start with uh, Taslima. Um, already, I think, uh, Nafisa said many things and gave some uh, suggestions. Uh, sometimes we uh, try to say that uh, when international uh, consumers, uh, they think maybe they don't need to uh, buy clothes or products from Bangladesh. Uh, and I don't think that boycott is a solution uh, because uh, it will destroy the industry. Uh, uh, consumers should uh, raise their voice about the pricing uh, they can make pressure on brands and they can talk about the fast fashion and fast fashion also creating a tremendous pressure on our uh, workers. And I want to add one, uh, I want to add with uh, Jyoti Moidas, uh, he replied on Abul Ajat Kalam's question about the international law. There is no international law uh, that can make responsible to brands, buyer, and the whole supply chain. But the uh, French parliament, they uh, introduce a law named due diligence uh, law. Um, and uh, the European Union, they are also trying to introduce this uh, law. In After Rana Plaza collapse, uh, there was an agreement named Rana Plaza agreement. Through this agreement, uh, international brands buyer uh, donated uh, fund for uh, the uh, victim of Rana Plaza, but that was not uh, compensation, that was donation. And sometimes when uh, these kinds of things happen, like Rana Plaza collapse or fire in any factory or COVID situation which uh, affected garment workers uh, hugely, that time people think that they can show their empathy, they can show their sympathy, they can do charity for workers, but uh, our workers, they are not beggar. I think we should remember these things. They are not beggar, they are fighter, and they are fighting for their rights. So when we will talk about our Bangladeshi garment workers, when uh, international consumer, they were also talking and thinking to do something, we think we should uh, show our respect that our uh, Bangladeshi people, the garment workers, the citizen of Bangladesh, uh, they want to protect their dignity, which is very important uh, for us. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, Shuti. Yes, uh, I'll be very quick. Um, what I, uh, I don't believe in is that uh, we are putting the onus on the consumer when we're talking about the, um, uh, the when we talk about the pay, pay rise and other things, because it's, it's not even 1% of the total production cost. Uh, uh, the 1%, one, one cloth that you buy, only 1% goes to the worker, not even 1%. So if you look into the division of how, how the, uh, 
pricing is done. That's a all different ballgame altogether, and it's 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 a different mathematical question. But uh, I think we need to uh, question the actors in the field who are operating within the field and who are the people who can voice the uh, not only workers' right but also talk about the. Um, uh, equity within the field, um, the, the political field that that these movements are entrenched in. And I think it's important to uh, to actually revive the uh, trade union movements because I think one of the major problems with the neoliberal economy uh, and the shrinking of the state as, as uh, the, um, Nafisa also uh, mentioned is that uh, most of the union uh, union trade union movements have been either silenced or co-opted. And that is very crucial that that have that politics back in the center of this discussion, because we are talking about the technicalities, we are talking about the economics, but we are not talking about the social impact and the politics, and that has to be the center of this discussion. And I would, I would end the question here. Thank you. Thank you, Shuti. And I think I'm going to turn to Dina. Uh, for our final question, um, I think there are a couple of questions here about um, some of the myths that you were talking about in your comments, and particularly if you can uh, shed uh, some more light on the particular myths that are being illuminated at this moment. And uh, perhaps, you know, as we talk about myths and realities, um, what, what would you like to see? change in this framing of um, these myths, which obviously, you know, all, many presenters today have talked about that they do serve a purpose, some of these myths, they're very um, instrumental in serving a particular narrative about workers, about um, <clears throat> Bangladesh, about the industry. So uh, to you, Dina. Thank you. Um, gosh, the first thing I want to say is this uh, idea, this fear, one of the things myths do is generate fear. What will happen if you do something or if you don't do something? Um, it's interesting what we take for granted, for instance, this idea of um, raising garment workers wages will mean higher prices of clothing. It will mean higher prices of clothing if we assume that the brands and the manufacturers will do, will are not willing to cut down on the, num on the amount of profits that they have. I think it's really interesting. If you look at the extraordinary profit, Shuti was just referring to it, I suppose, in a different way. Um, paying workers more does not mean that cheap clothes, prices of cheap clothes have to go up. It just means that a Walmart or a CNA or a Mamadia group has to cut down a little bit on the profit that it makes, right? That's why can't we think about, why do we have to maximize profits? This is why I keep saying we have to really think this particular kind of neoliberal logic, right? That's, that's one thing. Um, there is also the myth of state protection, I should say. We, um, the US is not the only militarized police state. Bangladesh right now, Jyotin and I talked about this. Uh, I don't think it's just in the COVID uh, emergency uh, and I really appreciated his taking down this war metaphor. We're not in a war. We may be in a state of emergency. But I think the laws that we have on the books, um, there's this idea that the state will automatically protect garment workers, right? It's just not true. The lines between, there are blurred lines, as everybody said, between the state and the BGMEA that makes it very hard. Who is the industrial police for? We live in a place where... Um, it's impossible to have industrial dissent, labor dissent, without having the Digital Security Act. I think one of the things we need to see in Bangladesh when we're thinking about reframing is the problem of garment workers and their rights is not an individual problem, not just of the industry, but we have to look, I mean, if a garment worker gets on the street, which is the only way he or she is heard, they will be picked up by 10 different laws, as you know, Paslima and Jyoti Moy know very well. And they'll be um, booked. I've been looking at first information reports of uh, garment workers who are picked up. And it's so interesting. There's the Digital Security Act, under which you really, if you say anything you, you know, against the government, you can be picked up. But there are these older colonial laws of rioting and whatever else. But the government makes workers who are on the street who are trying to get their rights, um, 
they they're framed as conspirators or a drohi against the national interest. And I think we need to start thinking about what the the myth of the national interest, which carries so much. So why? What is the national interest? Is the national interest just keeping an an industry alive, or is it about actually having? um bodies that are you know citizens rights right so garment workers you know they veer from the there's always been moral panic around garment workers from a very long time they're either national heroes and or dangers you know polluting dangers to the national body but it, i think it's time that we start thinking about how to reframe our priorities inside bangladesh about what the national interest is and when we're talking about um, transnational solidarity and what I would like to see reframed is thinking about thinking not in these single issue terms I am going to help how can I help a garment worker but understanding how garment workers thinking more systemically I'll just leave it there I know we're out of time on that note um, I would unfortunately we have to close today we are all out of time um, I would just like to close by reminding everyone what uh, Nafisa said earlier, as we think about these multidisciplinary issues to pay attention to um, not only the global media, but also all kinds of me local medias too. Um, so thank you, South Asia Institute, and thank you to all of the wonderful panelists and my uh, session co-chair, Durba. Um, I thank everyone immensely. Thank you all so much. Thank you.